All right, good afternoon. My name is Rebecca McNulty and I'll be facilitating the session titled OER for Libraries and Textbook Affordability Partners. Um, before we begin, a quick reminder that the session is being recorded for future reference. And now, let me introduce our fantastic presenters, Lily Dubuck, Textbook Affordability Librarian, and Sarah Norris, Scholarly Communications Librarian, both from the University of Central Florida. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Just getting set up here. So again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I am Lily Dubach. Uh, and since about 2016, throughout all my roles at UCF, I have um, contributed to efforts related to OER or to textbook affordability, uh, especially in my specific role, textbook affordability librarian that I moved into in 2021. I'm joined here by Sarah Norris. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Lily said, I'm Sarah Norris. I am the Scholarly Communication Librarian at the UCF Libraries. I have been involved in a textbook affordability efforts since 2015 in a variety of different uh, areas. Most currently, uh, I continue to provide copyright and uh, Creative Commons license support for uh, our faculty and for our campus partners as we look to develop OERs and other kinds of TA efforts. As I go over our learning objectives, I would like to encourage our attendees to uh, please feel free to use the chat and tell us what your role is. Um, we have several goals for this session and those goals do depend on your role. So for our colleagues who do not work in a library, we hope that you learn about resources and expertise that your library at your institution may already have or should develop, could develop, depending on what's going on to support OER initiatives. Now, if you work in a library, we hope you gain ideas to start or enhance future thinking OER efforts. And then broadly, for everyone in attendance, uh, we do just want to emphasize the importance of communication and collaboration. That just covers everything we'll talk about today, whether you work in a library or not, um, as we support the future of learning with open education. Again, if you could put in the chat what your role is, we'll, we'll love to take a look as uh, we go through our presentation. Our agenda is as follows. Um, next, we'll cover OER definitions and why it makes sense that libraries are involved and the history of it here at the UCF Library specifically. After that, we'll go over what we call the five C's of uh, library involvement and collaboration for OER efforts. Um, as we go through those five C's, Keep in mind and jot down any ideas you have because uh, there will be activities at the end of this session that touch on all five of those. Just to make sure we are on the same page regarding definitions, these definitions have appeared in uh, several sessions during Open Ed Live. Um, open education, as defined by Spark, is broad. It encompasses resources, tools, and practices that are openly licensed. Um, and then OER specifically, as defined by UNESCO, is really more specifically about the learning, teaching, and research materials themselves that are openly licensed that uh, permit no-cost access, reuse, repurpose, adaptation, and redistribution by others. I'll now move this over to Sarah to talk about why it makes sense, uh, given these elements to be in libraries. Thanks, Lily. And it's nice to see everyone commenting in the chat. It looks like we have a good mix of instructional designers, librarians, OER advocates, and other specialists. So it's great to see everyone come together in today's session. So one of the first things that we were thinking about is library involvement in OER. And I think it's nice to kind of frame the conversation of why libraries and why librarians in OER efforts. And of course, it really is a natural fit. 
um, not only for libraries as institutions, but also for librarians and library staff based on the work that we do. So if perhaps you're not in a library and you're thinking about partnering with librarians, uh, there are many different skill sets uh, and unique things that we can contribute to OER creation and OER education uh, and adoption. So in general, the idea of democratizing information and providing free and unfettered access to that information really aligns with the core values of libraries. And along with our unique skill sets, it does, again, make us a real natural fit for OER um, participation. Libraries have been at the fore of open movements uh, more broadly since the inception. And what we've really seen over the years is that grow and evolve with more of that emphasis on open educational resources and textbook affordability efforts. Librarians and libraries, as well as library staff, have been key partners and active participants in both the creation of, as well as the maintenance of, a lot of different open initiatives, whether they're large or small, local, national, international. Uh, and librarians can provide a lot of technical pedagogical and disciplinary contributions that are really helpful. So with this in mind, we have seen that there has been a real increase in the number of OER and TA positions. And I think a few of you commented about those in the chat. And there's no doubt that we're going to see more of those roles for libraries and librarians continue to evolve. So next slide. We wanted to provide a little bit of history and context about OER and TA efforts here at UCF over the past decade. This of course is the briefest of timelines with just a few highlights from our efforts and it's by no means comprehensive of the outstanding work that's done to support textbook affordability at our institution. Uh, as we'll explore today, and Lily mentioned this as well, partnerships and communities of practice really play a vital role in the success of these kinds of efforts. And you can see so much of that partnership and community in the things that we've done at UCF. So at UCF, um, looking back in 2015, conversations about more coordinated efforts began during that time. There was a small group of um, five individuals, librarians and instructional designers, was part of that team. We came together to form uh, just an informal working group to discuss and aim to potentially address issues related to affordable learning. The group's efforts led to the creation of our first OER with an English faculty member. It's an anthology of medieval literature. That document, that book continues to be used, uh, adapted, in fact, we just met with that faculty member recently to update it, uh, and they've continued to create other OER content as well. In 2018, those informal activities that were taking place shifted a bit and they were more formalized with our institution-wide initiative known as AIM. That includes not only broad OER creation, but also other aspects of what we refer to as pillars of affordability here at UCF. So that will include first day, library source materials, and affordability counts as well. And then during all of this, uh, UCF libraries recognized that there was a need for a dedicated position related to TA. Uh, and in 2019, we hired our first te textbook affordability librarian position, and that's now held by Lily, which brings us to today. Um, UCF's textbook affordability efforts continue to grow and evolve. Uh, you've heard about so many of the efforts that we've done here uh, throughout the last three days. It really is a true collaboration among our instructional designers, um, Lily as the TA librarian, specialized librarians like myself, and others from the AIM initiative. So that's a little bit about us, a little bit of background for today's conversation. So I'm going to turn it back over to Lily. She's going to kick us off on that 5C approach for librarians and textbook affordability partners to consider about OER. Thank you, Sarah. So starting off, the first C is about cultivate. So as you think about your own institution, the first thing you would do is try to develop a community. You may already have this, um, or you may consider others at your campus that should be informed or get involved in OER efforts. 
Uh, this slide shows a number of examples of departments to reach out to from academic departments to student groups and anywhere in between. Um, really, so many uh, different places on campus may have an interest or may be impacted by OER. Now, this is just um, a list to get you started to think about it, but I like to highlight examples and resources uh, that can help guide you if you are at this stage. And uh, an excellent resource is the OER Starter Kit for Program Managers, specifically Chapter 3 on Building Your Team, authored by Abby Elder. Uh, that is an excellent example on building your team. And then, as Sarah mentioned uh, before, you, at UCF, we have the Affordable Instructional Materials, or AIM, initiative here that shows our collaboration and, and different uh, members that are involved. Once you have uh, developed your team or individuals to be around with, with these shared communications and strategies, you want to focus on education. You can share freely available educational materials, such as uh, recordings from conferences or events or webinars, or you could go as in-depth as creating an event kind of like this one that we did that you could host or launch yourself. Um, there are a number of certificates. And again, we're just showing a couple small examples. Um, and the one listed on the bottom, resources from FLVC, Florida Virtual Campus, Open Florida Guide. They're also hosting a OER boot camp next month as well. And if anyone has that link to put into the chat, that would be appreciated. And then on each uh, slide that we have for these five C's, we put a tiny little idea on how to think about these in the future. So for cultivating interest in the future, um, I think kind of broadly about, well, what if OER education and support is so intertwined in a campus um, culture that it's part of the tenure and promotion process. And I know some institutions are further along in that than others, but a broad application of that would, would be an idea to help support cultivating um, this interest and these efforts. I'll now turn it back to Sarah for the next C. Great, so now that you've sort of thought about developing that community of practice or potential partners that you might be working with, how do you then move to the next step, which is thinking about curation, thinking about navigating those high quality OER materials and making them really accessible and usable by your faculty. So as you're getting started, probably the first thing that you're going to think about is many of those excellent repositories dedicated to OER that are available. Many of our faculty, in fact, the panel that was earlier today talked about many of these different kinds of repositories. There are a lot of whether they're locally driven, state driven, national or international, there's some really outstanding ones that have already curated a lot of open content, um, much of which has been uh, well vetted, some peer reviewed. So there's a lot of excellent resources already at your disposal. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that's something you'll definitely wanna think through. Equally, you may also think about institutional repositories, whether it's something that you have locally at your own institution, you can think about it twofold. One, actually using it to store any open educational resources that your faculty might create, but also thinking about other resource repositories and resources that others have created. Um, at UCF, we have STARS, which is our institutional repository, and we actually have an OER collection there, including that anthology of medieval literature. So there are many different avenues you can look for high quality materials, I know the faculty members earlier mentioned Pressbooks directory. That could be another spot for an open book platform. You'll also want to think about maybe search strategies, helping faculty navigate different kinds of searches based on their needs. Thinking about creating guides or lists, other ways that you can co-locate and access those OER materials, making it as easy to navigate and determine if those materials are appropriate for faculty to use. And of course, I'm a scholarly communication librarian, so I would be remiss not to mention copyright and licensing. Um, definitely want to be mindful of copyright and licensing, all of those things. 
making sure that not only the content is copyright compliant or openly licensed or in the public domain, but if there are licenses, ensuring that you understand what those licenses mean so that you can best modify, remix, adapt those um, OERs as needed. Next slide. Equally in the curation process, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you consider accessibility. This is deeply important. So we do wanna make sure that we're mindful of providing information and recommendations to faculty who might be considering either, either utilizing or creating OERs. You could explore creating a toolkit specifically related to OER and accessibility. There are also toolkits out there that may exist that you could utilize, repurpose, and adapt for your needs. You also don't have to be an expert in this area. There are so many resources at our institutions with good expertise and insight on accessibility needs. Whether uh, student accessibility services or a similar kind of unit at your institution or even a digital accessibility team. Those are all really great resources and partners uh, to connect with to make sure that we're curating and connecting that accessibility component. In terms of curating in the future, what could that look like? You were thinking of some different ideas and how might you might use advanced technologies, not only to find and store open content, but also to make that content interoperable or connect across platforms. There's so many different repositories. So are there tools and technologies we could consider to make those things talk and connect to each other? Again, just for easier access for our faculty to get uh, to those open materials that they need. Next slide. So once you've moved beyond that curation stage, you may be thinking about consulting, about moving beyond just providing information, actually being active participants or providing stronger information related to OERs. Next slide. A key component of that is offering expertise and guidance, whether you're in the library or you're in another unit at your institution. I think one really important point is that in many cases at your institution, this may be uh, the most that you can provide to your faculty when it comes to OERs, rather than uh, being a full-scale service for OER creation. So this is gonna be an area where you can really think about how can we provide um, the most support, knowing that perhaps scalability or bandwidth might be more challenged to create full OER. So what can we do to help connect our faculty with different kinds of expertise and guidance? Librarians, of course, have so many different kinds of expertise that can be utilized. Again, you don't have to know all the things. You don't have to be an expert in all of those areas. So really tapping all of those folks uh, to utilize their different expertise and consult. I know in many cases here at UCF, uh, we'll have a cohort of librarians and instructional designers that might meet with a faculty member to talk through and provide our different expertise. Librarians, whether they're a dedicated position or a functional expert like copyright or even a technical expert when it comes to metadata can be super helpful for faculty either creating or navigating the open landscape. You'll also wanna consider uh, highlighting the expertise of your campus partners, whether it's an instructional designer, um, and there's many of you on who are all such outstanding and amazing partners. Your Office of General Counsel, if legal concerns come up, really tap those synergies for campus partnerships. You know, we work so well together to be able to provide well-rounded services um, to our campus community. And then lastly, connecting to experts, colleagues, and listservs. That is great not only for finding out information that you can bring back to faculty on a specific query or issue or a certain subject area, but also, again, you don't have to be the expert in all of these things. We, uh, as People who are providing guidance can utilize our colleagues to get additional expertise insight uh, and learn a bit more and develop our skill sets. Next slide. So how do you articulate the kinds of things that you can provide to your community? And I think one really great way is to develop a guide or website information to highlight that expertise. You can, of course, highlight the services, the resources, those repositories that we mentioned, 
but also librarian expertise. Uh, you might have a little section that includes discipline specific or functional experts. This is, hey, if you need copyright, you can go to Sarah. If you need um, help with humanities research, perhaps you go to this humanities subject librarian if you have subject or um, discipline specific librarians. That could be a great way to connect those to faculty. Um, of course, you're going to want to think about existing resources that are out there and many other kinds of considerations. And then, of course, consulting in the future, things we might think about. Lily and I were brainstorming, we thought a, a generative AI chatbot to think about consult level questions to sort of get faculty started could be a great sort of baseline and something we could explore. And I'll turn it back over to Lily to wrap up our five C's. Thank you, Sarah. So beyond just the consultation level, um, your institution may be able to delve into the more collaborate intensive level of providing services or being really hands-on with these projects or these efforts and initiatives. Um, when you delve into these types of projects that are at the collaboration level, consider what is your project. Earlier today, we heard from the anthropology department and they talked about how an adoption project is less intensive time-wise and work-wise than an authorship project of creating OER or adapting OER. Or maybe your project is to simply spread the word about um, OER adoptions and to encourage that. But consider what your available time is and who your collaborators will be. And when you figure that out, you will agree on responsibilities. And we strongly encourage that you either pose an uh, informal memo or a more formal MOU, depending on what your institution allows for, for those sorts of agreements. Uh, next, you can consider finding a toolkit or template for projects. Um, uh, they exist in a number of forms. We have one example on this slide. Um, and of course, referring to the OER starter kit for program managers again, um, lots of different resources out there. A really uh, excellent example of a joint OER initiative is from University of North Florida, where they have a team of instructional designers and librarians forming their joint OER initiative. And then whatever you are working on, uh, develop uh, communication and project management standards for your ongoing work. Thinking about collaboration in the future, again, uh, Sarah and I thought about, well, AI is really what everyone's talking about right now. But uh, as a cautionary thing to consider, please do remain aware of the ongoing legal or ethical considerations. Um, it is very possible that laws will change or your specific institution policies may change or impact how you can use AI in any of these efforts. But if you can, if you can utilize generative AI or other more advanced tools, think about how it could help you create outlines for OER or create testing questions, develop other types of media, maybe even translate an OER. Um, and then just try to emphasize how the AI can help make your content a bit more adaptive or interactive and just enhance it in ways that we haven't even listed on this slide yet. Just try to keep thinking about those ideas and moving forward. And now the last C, champion. So once you have your OER initiative going, uh, you really want to showcase the stories, the success stories. Figure out which faculty have adopted OER or created OER and how that has impacted their students for the better. Now, it is pretty typical to um, see textbook savings or cost avoidance highlighted, which, which are important pieces of the discussion, but think beyond that. How do these efforts really impact students, such as through success metrics like course completion rates and things like that? You can also think about developing awards and recognition programs. In our examples, um, the one at UCF that we've mentioned throughout the Open Ed Live event is the AIM High Awards. We have an individual award, a group award, and then a student's choice award as well. 
uh, lots of different models to follow or create your own as, as you develop these efforts. And then as Sarah and I were thinking about, well, how will this look in the future? And we thought about how championing OER efforts would really be supported if more studies were conducted that address the gaps in the literature. So additional studies that interdisciplinary researchers can conduct that identify other benefits of, um, of adoption of OER or that target various variables that aren't necessarily pinpointed in some of the current literature that we see. So that is our last idea and we are now moving on into the discussion activities. Again, uh, please be aware that um, there will be one question per C. So I will show you how to do this. Um, in a second, I'm going to show you that we're actually going to use Padlet, which may be a little different from other sessions uh, during Open Ed Live, but we're going to give it a go. So as Rebecca puts the link into the chat, I'm going to show you what it looks like. For question one, this is the screen. And the way you will answer this question, which is, how have you or your colleagues cultivated interest in OER at your institution? And what's next to try? The way you'll answer this is by clicking on the plus in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. You simply click that, write something. So after you write something, this publish button will show up and you hit that and it will display. I'm not going to uh, push this through, but I am going to stop sharing my screen and we will wait to see what comes up. All right, so I'm starting to see uh, some entries. Collaborating with librarians was added, department presentations. The next one, OER early adopters present in department meetings and events, shared resources by discipline, templates for adjuncts. Excellent idea to, to provide support for adjuncts as they are not always in departmental meetings. Yeah, lots lot of, of ideas. Yeah, lots of programming, outreach. That's super helpful. Like some of the events here, the OER, Oh, we are novel. I like that. That's great with carnival theme, getting a fun perspective on it. Student advocate packet here with members. That's really great. That student perspective is so critical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we forget about that. And I see affordability, accessibility, and content creating for elementary school teachers curriculum. Definitely. That's an excellent idea. I see a provost mandate for all courses to move away from print textbooks to OER, OA, and licensed ebooks. Yeah, like there's a lot of student created OER. That's a great, I love that getting students involved more directly in the OER creation active participants and also student government as well. Definitely. They're really great stakeholders and partners. Something else you can do with these entries, if you want to uh, click on the little heart by ones that you like, you can feel free to do that. And you can also comment on ones that have already been submitted in Padlet. But one of the newest ones I see, we convened a university-wide steering committee with diverse stakeholders to try to cultivate interest and community around OER, student and faculty surveys for baseline data. That's excellent. Oh, there's a question on one of them. So the the entry about the provost mandate for all courses to move away from print textbooks to OER, 
um, there's a question, how did the bookstore handle this mandate? If you submitted that one, feel free to um, either comment below or you can unmute in here, depending on your preference. And so we've got even the OER marker and courses that have low or no cost. Yeah, that's a great, that can be a great identifier for students and way for them to ascertain if that's an affordable option. It's great. Definitely. All right. Well, I'll give it one more moment and then we'll move on to question two. I see one more entry. Registration scheduling OER marker on courses that have low or no cost. Uh, and then a follow up to that our student information system won't let us do that. So we are bidding for a new one. Mm. And I'm hopeful that that will happen at uh, UCF soon as well. Okay. I think we are ready to move on to question two. Feel free to keep question one up. Oh. Actually, there is a response to the provost mandate for all courses to move away from print textbooks OER. are. Um, there's a follow up to that. It says the bookstore is still in business as the migration to OER is slow. Faculty are allowed to use print textbooks if a good alternative is not found, which usually involves consultations with librarians. All right, we are now moving on to question two and Rebecca McNulty has put it into the chat. Question two is, think about the challenges related to finding OER. What feature do you hope to see added to systems that curate OER? And while we're waiting for folks to fill out the Padlet, there was a great comment in the chat that perhaps a nugget bot here at UCF that could be the library buddy for the night bot that could help us with curation or other aspects related to OER. I love that. <laughs> That's a great idea. And for those okay. who are not familiar, nugget is our little pony mascot, horse mascot, mini horse mascot. Yes, we're all about the knights and the horses and the pegasus <laughs> over here. Um, okay, so the answer, some answers already for what feature do you hope to see added to systems that curate OER? Um, let's see, we have some answers. English language translations of international resources. We also have easy connection to supplemental resources related to the main source. Oh yeah, that, oof, that takes a lot of time to try to find those supplemental resources if they're not connected. Um, Next one is certainly more graduate level OER that are not introductory at the subject level. Yes, when we had our student panel part of Open Ed Live, that, that was a point brought up by one of our student panelists. And another note towards um, supplemental materials such as tests, lecture notes, homework, course activities, online course apps, et cetera, several of these. And the peer review aspect of ha having faculty vet the potential resources, that has definitely been a continued challenge and concern. And I think has gotten a little bit better, but it's still definitely a challenge. LTIs for repositories for the learning management system or library management system, whichever you mean by LMS. Faculty use cases. And yeah, definitely hope to see more OER for health professions too. Um, I do know, I think there is currently an event going on now about nursing related OER. I feel like health professions, especially images and other kinds of third party materials tend to be challenging when building and creating OERs. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
I see a note was added to uh, the initial comment was English language translations of international resources. And then the note below that states utilizing translanguaging practices as well to deal with English as a second language learners. Excellent point. Okay. In a moment, we will transition to question three. Just going to pause for a second because I see someone is still typing. There it is. Okay, this is our last one. So reinforcement of the open sources in courses across curriculum and engaging more discussions to available open resources. Definitely. Thank you for your contributions to this. All right, we are moving on to question three. Question three is, if you could attend a consultation with an OER expert, what specific knowledge or skills would you like them to have? And the first one, deep knowledge of blending CC licenses together. Yes. I think depending on those cases, even for experts, that can be really tricky and time consuming. Absolutely. The Creative Commons licenses and those blending can certainly be very difficult and even trick up the most, trip up the most uh, a advanced person who works in copyright because they are nuanced. Mm-hmm. And then we got accessibility twice, almost like an accessibility jinx right there. Very important for sure. That That's also full of nuance and many considerations as you saw earlier today in the drop-in session. Tips and hacks for gearing up your campus for a more rapid adoption. I'm always glad to see copyright mentioned, but also a little sad too sometimes that no, I know that that can be a gap. It's a challenging area. Um, figuring out ways that you can leverage those OER experts who may are may not be Office of General Counsel, <laughs> which can be also a little bit of a intimidating, challenging barrier sometimes when it comes to copyright. Um, I know that can be difficult and it is so nuanced too. Definitely. And then we have an already prepared list of faculty subject experts who could review proposed e OER. That's an excellent idea to have to have yeah, some on definitely. standby for that. Um, then we go into explaining the differences to discipline faculty between free and open, what are OER and what are free to students but not OER. That continues to be a challenge, especially when you consider OER versus library source materials or sometimes even conflated with inclusive access materials. Lots of different confusion points there. Publishing guidance. I really like that best practices as well, figuring out ways to implement those for designing, training, digital resources. It's a really great idea. And then some about uh, more about the OER creation process and what are some good digital publishing tools. And again, that depends on institution to institution, which ones they can license and, and afford. Um, LMS tools that are available to integrate with OER specific to institution and variations by teaching modality. All right, we are about to transition to Question four, I don't see any further typing, but I'll pause for a moment just in case there are any. And we will move on to question four. Thank you again, Rebecca. All right, question four, how do you see AI impacting collaborative OER projects? We touched on this a little bit in our presentation and really, uh, looking forward to what ideas you may have. I know you've probably been in numerous conversations or even done projects yourself related to this already.
first one is proofing, curating, outlining, accessibility screening, et cetera. Yeah, streamlining it and making that process a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Definitely a good way to utilize AI. Could definitely save time. A writing partner, brainstorming, editing, et cetera. Yeah, it can, it can be a great thing to overcome writer's block. I like the image banks, the infographics for core concepts. And I think as AI continues to evolve, the copyright aspect is still feeling a little challenging, but there's so many more tools, um, even Firefly that really use today to create some of our images that are looking to do copyright compliance. So I think we'll see more of those in the future. And someone says, as a retired professor of language translation uh, that I know is confident that AI will be more than adequate for OER translations in a few years. Definitely. And then providing some more OER mm. creation in areas that do not have many OERs created as of yet, it would be excellent to um, be be in that level of communication and awareness to know which which subject areas to target. I'm definitely using a lot of AI for efficiencies, coming up with book titles, outlines, coming up with compelling information. I know Lily and I have done that lots. So we're like, our we need brainstorming help, and that can be a great way to come up with interesting and dynamic titles and other kinds of things. And there are some more specific um, notes here. Someone specifically used OpenAI and Claude AI um, for an OER project. And I like someone... the making sure to cite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cite accordingly, right? Being that transparency, I think that's super important when we're using AI. And someone noted AI is understanding emotion in both images and text. Exciting mm. times. Yeah, it is. I, I think there's quite a spectrum on how people feel about this from excitement to trepidation to very strong caution, but um, lots of possibilities as we see it unfold. And then combined with peer review, AI for creating OER can be a game changer. Excited to keep learning and teaching ethical use. That is an excellent one. All right, we are now going to move on to question five. Question five is, consider what you have learned from Open Ed Live, the event itself. What new ideas are you going to use to champion OER? Really excited to see what you add here. The first one says campus-wide OER teams with all the necessary stakeholders. Absolutely, you definitely wanna make sure anyone who might be impacted is involved. And I think more often than not, sadly, students are not kept in the loop. So prioritize that because it impacts them the most. Uh, and then the next one, more clearly convey my use of OER beyond textbooks to students. Use about 100 times more OER than I realize. Yeah, not only to your students, but also institutionally as well, too. Sort of, again, that awareness uh, and advocacy for using uh, free, low cost, uh, and low cost materials. So definitely important. Mm hmm yeah, and the multimedia aspect, I think, too, spreading awareness that it isn't just about textbooks and articles, but there's also multimedia. Yeah, there's so many different flavors and styles of things that are open and related that we want to definitely highlight. I see someone is writing a grant now and got an idea at a session yesterday to include funding for a tool, also including funding for events to celebrate progress and champions. Yes. That is excellent and really touches on the forward thinking, future thinking aspect 
of these efforts. Thank you so much for, for contributing to these. We will stay on this one for one more moment. Um, and then once we are done on question five, you will have a link to the Padlet overall in case you want to add anything to one of the past questions um, or take a look at it uh, over the next week or so. Um, once we are done, we will, um, over again in a, in a week or two, I will close this Padlet and export the data, which will become available to uh, attendees. And it looks like the last addition to this was fine tuning the topic for my research and dissertation on OER and being able to advocate for OER on campus. That's excellent. All right. Now, Rebecca will put into the chat just the overall link um, to the Padlet and feel free to um, look at that, uh, keep it handy for a bit. But again, do keep in mind that um, over in, in a week or two, I will close it, uh, but the data will be exported and made available to you. Now, as we, as we close, I will share my screen again. And just wanted to thank everyone for being here, for attending. If you want to reach out to Sarah or to myself, here is our contact information. And um, if you have any last second questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. But uh, we were excited to, to share this information with you and to participate in the activity. We have about four minutes if there are any questions. I see a lot of thanks in the chat and you are welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for participating and contributing to the activity. Yes, we really appreciate it, especially at four o'clock at the end of the three-day conference. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There is a question oh. that you are you both on LinkedIn? We are. Yes. I, mm -hmm. I'm not too active on it because social media is work, but <laughs> I am on it. <laughs> and then a question yes. in the chat. If you had one wish that would solve an OER problem for you, what would it be? Ooh. I think for me, it does stem back to needing those supplemental materials with OER. I want there to be uh, a lot more groups and work um, contributing to the creation of those supplemental materials for already existing OER and new ones to come. I would agree with that. I would also selfishly as a copyright person wish that copyright challenges and that interoperability between different Creative Commons licenses was easier to navigate and understand. Uh, that may be a big wish, but um, hopefully as more people get familiar with open licensing, that'll be easier for folks. Um, is there a way administratively that the integrative GEP could help support you more? Amy, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Feel free to unmute. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I should explain in context that I uh, work as a faculty fellow for College of Undergraduate Studies who birthed the Integrative GEP, Faculty Development, Outreach, Curriculum Alignment, and also helping you know, the faculty-student divide in that regard across disciplines. So as I was sitting here thinking about what you're talking about, we, from a faculty point of view, of course, are promoting OER, kind of almost a department by basis, college basis. But maybe we need to think in terms about how we could marry together the initiatives that you're doing and make it more of an overall holistic experience saying, okay, if one of the things we want to do is provide an integrative experience for our GEP or general education program for those who may not use the same terms at UCF, 
would there be a way that we could help highlight, host, or otherwise connect your initiatives to our initiatives as a conjoined process? Just thinking. It's more of a statement than a question. Yeah. However, um, I, I just kind of got to thinking about this, that uh, and this could apply to anyone at any institution that, you know, if we are, we at UCF use a programmatic level of integration across general education program core courses that all students have to take, whether they're first time in college or transfers that had to have done it beforehand. So what I'm thinking of is that maybe we need to collaborate a little bit more with not just the library at all, but also how you are, are promoting the OER, which promotes not only you and your library and services and everything that that encompasses, but then also how um, we can bring more awareness to the multiplicity of roles that mm -hmm. the library plays. Um, and how students doing that. What brings this to mind is the shock of someone telling me they're a senior and they've never stepped foot in the library even <laughs> once, which killed me. But um, even even if it is virtually stepping into the library, um, I, I'm just thinking, maybe think about some ways, maybe we have some conversations about ways that we can join those uh, activities together. Yes, we should. I love how this session has led to kind of a cultivation of that idea, which could lead to our collaboration uh, even more for this. Um, just trying to tie it back to our C's. And I love Kevin's idea in the chat to set OER adoption goals for GEP courses. I think that's excellent and we're, could be very well supported with um, OpenStax having very high quality, robust OER resources that can really match a lot of the GEP courses. And, uh, Maybe we need to make a little nugget item, and he can become he can become your 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 pet, right? And then we'll just promote you like crazy, but with a little mini nugget in there, and he'll and he can make a nugget bot, and we'll have a little nugget icon. That's the OER of UCF is the nugget. I love nuggets it. of knowledge. You know, <laughs> I love the play on words. So Excellent. I don't think Thanks. there's any better way to close a session than invoking nuggets. All right. Thank you so much, Lily and Sarah, and for all of the interaction in the Padlet and in the chat with our participants. That was such a great session. Um, to close us off, we'll welcome Amanda Major back on to leave us with some parting remarks. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Pardon the delay. There we go. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us here at Open Ed Live. We've been on an incredible journey. These past three days, we've explored the future of open education to improve learning for all. Now, before, before we go into uh, our, our reflections of this event, just take a moment to reflect and offer us some feedback. Um, we really value your suggestions. And if you do not have a chance to complete the survey now, uh, please do so when it arrives in your inboxes. We'll have the presentations and recordings of sessions available as soon as possible on the Open Ed Live website, or webpage rather. You can refer back to these as often as you'd like. And with that, let's dive into a quick reflection of our journeys now. So some of what we've heard during this event has served to reinforce our existing understanding of open education. We've delved into its various facets, explored how it intersects with artificial intelligence, policy, pedagogy, library roles, faculty teamwork, accessibility, and the transformative power of open educational resources. With all this sharing, these exchanges, We've broadened our understanding of, of open education. Our collective knowledge has grown stronger. We stand more confident in our current paths, but what's more, we leave this event inspired. Inspired to take chances for the greater good. With so many supportive organizations, actual resources, and helpful people, 
why not venture further into this open education safety net? But why? Well, let's explore the multitude of intentions that drive us. Open education allows us to veer away from the conventional, to break free from rigid structures and to embrace innovation. Open education honors our students, enabling them to access knowledge freely, to collaborate in their learning journeys, even to create. Open education empowers us to curate something uniquely reflective of our content, ourselves, our learners, our rich cultural surroundings. It's a canvas for creativity, for personalization. Open education is about making a lasting impact on students. They can affordably take their education with them into the future. It's a commitment to their access to their success. So my friends, librarians, instructional designers, faculty members, and policy creators, why not dip your toe into the water or dive in headfirst into the deep end? We can navigate these waters together and chart a course toward a more empowered educational oceanic expanse for all. Nicole Allen and Wendy Howard reminded us of the market forces that can conflate open education. They reminded us that our organizational leaders, while remaining steadfastly dedicated to the greater mission of higher learning, can also grapple with the existential next right step. Our part is to engage in that conversation, showing up, showing out as Jonathan espoused in their keynote, only bounded by the confines of our influence. Jonathan reminded us, reminded us that amidst uncertain waters in the open education space, we can embrace the uncertainty, even renegotiate it. We can renegotiate with our proverbial sails, anchors, or stars to navigate us. So now I'm gonna give you a few questions to reflect upon. Feel free to unmute your mic. Um, write your answers in the in the chat. Whatever whatever comes to you is is the right thing to put out there. So I'm curious, what changes do you see in the open education movement? What challenges do you anticipate? What did you gather from the sessions that you'll take away with you? Now this could be links to resources, possible new collaborations, new contacts, new ideas whatever you'd like. Okay, well, I'll let you reflect. Oh, the collaborative energy over the past few days. Yeah, it really has. And I'm sure that there'll be many takeaways from this open ed live event and it's something to reflect about the changes the challenges and and what you'll move forward with it is wonderful to connect with old friends and make new ones absolutely yes always something new to learn accessibility that was a great session absolutely Yep, it will be, our resources will be available for your reference, absolutely. Students, teaching assistants, research fellows, we are a community, we do not, absolutely. Thank you for that. Remember our journey doesn't end here. Keep exploring, keep advocating, Keep implementing open education. Next week, March 4th through the 8th, is Open Ed, Open Ed Week, and that will be celebrated globally across the nation. Our colleagues at the FLVC will hold the intensive OER boot camp, 
March 27th through the 29th. Added that to the chat for you. Well, planning, coordinating, promoting, designing, our UCF team for this Open Ed Live event did all of that. So they deserve some special acknowledgements. Please put your virtual hands together or just send out some floating hearts. Show your gratitude. These are the superheroes of this event. Thank you to everyone who created this space so that this wealth of resources, exchanges, knowledges could be had. We have one more very special thanks to dole out. The Open Ed Live Planning Committee wants to thank you for your incredible engagement and participation. Let's celebrate the power of open education. Our collective efforts do contribute to a more meaningful learning environment. Thank you all for being part of Open Ed Live.